So first is the fundamental question, what does the term to forgive mean in your tradition? Which I would like to address with the second question. What support in your ancient writings for this view could you give? You know, the Christian tradition accepts the Hebrew Bible. Of course, our Christian vision helps us interpret and receive the Hebrew Bible in a particular way. So following the uh, beautiful discourse of Rabbi Sachs, I am trembling before you and I'm thankful that he's not here. <laughs> he, might, uh, he might pull me down <laughs> back to my seat, uh, but no, he will not do that in a conference on forgiveness. <laughs> but again, to our uh, Jewish sisters and brothers here, I will present a Christian reading of the Hebrew scripture from this perspective of forgiveness. According to some scholars, God is almost always the subject of the verb to forgive in its many, very, in its many forms. And by that, the Hebrew Bible tells us that guilt incurred by a particular offense against God, against the covenant relationship, is annulled by God's act of forgiving. And by that action of God, people are released from the power of guilt. It is a liberation. And by that release and liberation, persons are restored to a state of reconciliation. This reconciled uh, state brings about spiritual blessings, also physical, material blessings, health, security, honor, even children. Exodus 34, verse 7 how God manifests God's self as a merciful, compassionate God. And that's good, huh? Health comes with forgiveness. Maybe every hospital must have that section. Many of the health issues might be connected to the, this imprisonment caused by the inability to forgive. Am I still making sense here? No, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So forgiveness by God and later on by human beings towards other human beings is concerned about the means by which those have been alienated from God or from one another. An alienation, a separation dealt on us by sin, by evil. How could we be reconciled to God and also to one another? But it is only because God is a God who is willing to forgive that forgiveness between peoples is possible. The forgiving love of God comes from God's mercy and compassion. And the word, rahamim, this graciousness of God, this compassion of God, is related to the womb. This is the maternal attachment of God to God's people. An attachment that a mother fully understands. 
May I know who among you here are mothers? Yeah. Yeah. You understand it. This is the maternal, maternal instinct of God. No matter what you do or what you are, I may disagree with what you have done, but you came from my womb. You are my child. So it comes from the guts. It comes from the uh, inner and sacred part of God described or compared to a mother. Can a mother forget her child? Even if a mother forgets her child, I will never forget you. Forgiveness, therefore, is a manifestation of God's fidelity to persons who are not considered as other, alien, but as my own. Forgiveness is not substituting something so that the damage done by the evil could be erased. No, we have a God who is sympathetic, not apathetic. A God who is always with those whom God had created and has made his own. I know that is uh, a quite simplistic uh, uh, summing up of, of this very complex theme. But I chose this in order to lead me to the New Testament, to the figure of Jesus. And uh, how refreshing it is to hear from Rabbi Sachs how, how Jesus was most a Jew when he prayed that. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. And for the Christians, Jesus proclaims in word and deed God, and he incarnates the mercy, the merciful, forgiving love of God. In the New Testament written in Greek, the word for forgiveness is aphasis, which is very much in line with the Hebrew scripture, which means remittance of a debt, release from debt. So again, the image of liberation. But with the release of the person from indebtedness, you do not just return to a status ante. No. The relationship remains. So there is a distinction between the evil act and the person. Jesus taught us many things, especially in parables. It's easier to talk about forgiveness through narrative rather than through concepts and notions. That's why Jesus' teachings regarding forgiveness and mercy either happened in concrete encounters with people whom he thought needed forgiveness, needed that release from entrapment or through narratives. Uh, some of the most uh, important parables of forgiveness are in the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. The first parable of the lost sheep, the shepherd leaving the 99 good sheep in search of the one that is lost. The second is the lost 
coin, the woman who cleans up the whole house in search of that one coin, and the third is the prodigal son. Yeah, the lost sheep. Why would you leave the 99 in search of one that is lost or probably wounded? If you're a businessman, that one lost sheep, whether wounded or ill, is a liability. You already have a business asset in the 99. Why leave the 99 that are profitable for the one that might even cost you a lot? And the only reason is, it is mine. It might be wounded, but it, it is mine. And if it cannot come home, I will carry it home. And later on, Jesus will say, that's a mark of the good shepherd. He lays down his life for his sheep. It is not a loss of life because the sheep are his own connectedness of life. The prodigal son, the son returns home. If I were the father of that son, I would have really met him at the gate and say, stop, explain to me, what have you done to my, the inheritance that I had given you? I needed an accounting. But here, you don't see that. No questions. It is the son who was supposed to restore what he had wasted. But instead, in the parable, the father restores the son to the dignity of being son. It doesn't matter whether the wealth is not restored, restitution in this case. What is important is my son. And here, the words are very significant. The son was lost and is found. The son was dead and is back to life. So our belief in the resurrection is already linked to the power of new life being offered to someone who wants to be restored in one's identity as a child of God and who wants to come home. And Jesus in his other teachings would say in Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the merciful, for they will find mercy. And in St. Luke chapter 6, be merciful. Why? Because the Lord, the Father, is merciful. And in the prayer that Jesus taught us, we ask God to forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have transgressed against us. And in another parable in Matthew 18, you have this servant who was forgiven of his debt by the master, but then he met someone, a fellow servant, who owed him less than what he had owed the master, but he failed to forgive his fellow servant. And that, in he incurred the ire of the master. He said, you had been forgiven. How come you could not forgive? So here, having experienced the forgiveness of God, we are hopefully equipped to forgive others too. 
having experienced God's gracious forgiveness in our lives and being attentive to that, I do not merit it. But God loves me to wholeness. God restores me to my humanity. If I have experienced that from God, why could I not share that gift to other people? So this is fidelity to God, fidelity to my humanity, and fidelity also to the humanity of other people.